Despite being on all three of my favorite songs of the year lists, I've never really been the biggest fan of Callie's music. She has a couple bangers here and there, but her albums usually fall flat for me. I liked half of the Deadbeat EP, Go was the only song I liked from Your Mori. I don't even think I listened to Unalive and constantly forget it even exists. And then I think I only listened to Holy Shito and Marimaro when they came out, which I liked the latter. And there's plenty of songs she's released that I just never bothered to listen to because unlike some creators, I don't feel like wasting my time on something that I know I probably won't vibe with. But with Cinderella, I decided to give it a listen because of Cringecore being the official sequel to Gah, and also it is Callie's debut album under a label. Though as a content creator, it hurts seeing her being signed to UMG. So I decided to give it a listen. And then gave it another one. And another one. And another one. Yeah, honestly, this album's grown on me a lot since the first listen, and I pretty much like every song. Taste of Death is a bop with Callie bringing in some great melodies, with my favorite being at the beginning line of the chorus. Watching you from the shadows where I wonder Could I only the fear make me stronger That just sounds so fucking good to my ears. I don't like how Let You Subdue Me and Take This Body and Use Me makes me think of Boy in a Band, though. I initially didn't like Wanted Wasted because of the operatic rock chorus that I just feel like is so played out, and in general is so much that it ruins any bit of power or emotion in most cases, but I won't deny that on later listens it's had me bouncing my leg to it every now and then. I also like the fast flows with aggressive delivery during the verses, and my favorite part is the pre-chorus after the bridge where she's saying Tidy and I over and over. <laughs> I don't know why, that's just gotten stuck in my head many times. I'm Greedy is another bop, and hearing Callie rap about loving money isn't something I thought I'd hear, but it sounds nice. Internet Brain Rod is yet again another bop, but please someone tell me this is satire. I don't want to believe that Callie's unironically writing anti-woke shit. But I get it to an extent. She's gone through a lot of shit throughout the past few years. The line still stands out, though. Nasumi Scheme is probably my second least favorite song on the album. It's not bad, but it just does nothing for me. Soul Food was an honorable mention on my favorite songs of 2022 list. Cringecore was going to be an honorable mention on my favorite songs of 2022 list. Dance Past Midnight was dangerous on my first listen because it made me want a Tokyo trip. But the roads were wet. It's a great song, though, with great production. Anomaly is great as usual. Death Sentence is my least favorite from the album. This one actually does sound bad. And no, it's not because of the auto-tune, that actually sounds fine. The only song that I hate the auto-tune on is I'm Good, which that song is bad for many other reasons, but the auto-tune sounds like fucking nails on a chalkboard to me. Nah, just nothing really on the song sounds good to me, from the beat to the lyrics, just nothing about it makes me want to listen to it. Glass Slipper is really good. I love the guitar on here, Callie's voice sounds ethereal, and the chorus and post-chorus are really good. Overall, I would say that this is Callie's best project she's ever released, and also my favorite. I mean, statistically, yes, because I like more tracks from this than any of her other work. <laughs> it's a solid album. Nothing really here that I think I would put into a playlist, but occasionally I like to just put it on shelf and enjoy 8 out of the 10 tracks. Oh boy, yeah. Reflections of a Broken Memory is a movie that I did not finish. I'll just start it with that. And I know there's a conversation to be held about reviewing things that you haven't finished, and it's totally valid to say that you shouldn't review something if you haven't experienced the full thing. The way I like to handle it, though, is just by giving my reasons as to why I didn't finish the movie, give it praise where I can, and most importantly, not give it a score. Anytime I don't finish something but still talk about it, I give it a DNF out of 10, and I think that's fair. So on to the movie, Reflections of a Broken Memory is a film I found on some random site that listed every movie that had been released in 2022, and all I had read was just the description, and it seemed pretty intriguing. Also, thanks to Jonas, I've become a sucker for titles like that. So starting off with some positives, I think the movie has some real potential. The writing gave me some Charlie Kaufman vibes with how trippy, weird, and slightly confusing it can get. Some Nolan vibes as well with what came to mind was Inception. Mainly just because I remember being confused from the, like, 20 minutes I saw of that movie. <laughs> and while I wouldn't say it seemed inspired by, I was thinking of Tarantino a couple times given the broken structuring of the story. That one's mostly just because of the clip of Tarantino talking about the problem with Hollywood being them following the same structure for everything. It's not the fact that I'm like, I'm this big crusade against linear storytelling. All right, but it's the thing is, it's not the only game in town. Yeah. I think that both Sandy Moling and Julia James are the best actors in the movie. There's a bit of gay representation in the film, but it's also a little confusing because at a certain point it's said that the main character's boyfriend was a girl at one point. Maybe that was explained in the half an hour I didn't watch, but for the most part I think the representation was handled correctly. I have no idea how it's supposed to, I'm just basing my judgment off of what I've heard from the community in various places. But given the fact that the relationship is handled like any other relationship and you could change the gender of the main character's love interest and nothing changes, 
I think means it's done well. <laughs> I could be entirely wrong though, and if anybody who's more knowledgeable on the topic disagrees, tell me in the comments. I would love to be more educated on this. And a story about a guy who has a broken memory and a second persona having to figure out what caused the death of someone is a pretty interesting story if it was tackled right. But I feel like once you get into the editing and a bit of the writing is when things start to go downhill. The pacing of this movie gets pretty abysmal at times, and I don't really blame it much on the writing, but more the editing. You get scenes where a character says a line of dialogue, then cut to another character repeating that dialogue, then cut to a separate third character saying that same exact dialogue, and sometimes it all interlapses over each other, making it really hard to understand what's being said, and in general destroys the pacing. Shots and scenes are often heavily repeated in this blurred line of stylistic choice or not having enough footage. The dialogue at times will enter in people don't talk like this territory. The performances from some actors is pretty fucking dead at times. Characters will make decisions that make no sense as to why. Like, there's this whole part of the story where the detective needs to lock into this certain part of the main character's brain to make him think that she's his dead sister in order to get anywhere with him, and then at one point just breaks out of the character and starts berating him. I guess I could see it as an attempt of giving a character flaws and having her own feelings take over and make her overstep, but it just comes off as extremely unprofessional and amateur behavior coming from a detective. Like, I just don't believe that that would happen. And to be fair, this is Marco Bazzi's second movie that he's directed, fourth movie that he's written, and third movie that he's edited, so it makes sense that all these problems are there, but they still kill my enjoyment for the movie and left me incredibly bored that I couldn't bring myself to finish it. With all that being said, if you like this movie, good for you. And I wish nothing but the best for Marco, and I hope he succeeds in what is obviously something that he loves. I'd be willing to check out whatever he does next. Now, the only Darren Aronofsky movie I've seen is Requiem for a Dream. Shameless self-promo, go listen to the Disagree episode where Jonas and I talked about it along with Spirited Away, because yes. I went for something wholesome. <laughs> you went for this. I've been meaning to watch his other movies, most notably Black Swan, Mother, and The Wrestler, but I've just never gotten around to it. But given the fact that I do like Requiem for a Dream a lot, so much so that when I had to pick between Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, Into the Spider-Verse, Requiem for a Dream, or The Matrix to buy a physical copy of, I chose Requiem, that I was obviously going to watch this just on that fact alone. I have never seen a single Brennan Fraser movie in my life. I have no personal connection to him, but hearing about how his career kind of went down the drain and then that six minute standing ovation made me a bit more interested in the movie. And then the first trailer was released and this was a bit that they showed. I need to know that I have done one thing right with my life. And that just sold me. I really wanted to see this in an IMAX theater, but that would have been a three hour drive in the evening on a day where it ended up raining but had chances of snow, so there was no way I was doing that. So I had to settle for the AMC theater half an hour away from me, which ended up giving me my first theater moment. I get it now. The theater going experience is great when you end up having a great crowd. We were laughing at some of the funny moments. I heard the person next to me laugh after I started laughing. It felt like we were just all connected, even though we're total strangers to each other. My favorite part of the movie was when I heard this really beautiful guitar in the soundtrack coming from the right side of the room. And then it just turned out to be some asshole's alarm going off. And then I heard the person next to me say, oh, come on. Anyways, my thoughts on the movie is it's good. Brendan Fraser is fucking incredible. So is Hong Chao. Sadie Sink is great, and I think her character is written extremely well. I gave Terrifier two shit for having shitty characters being shitty for no reason other than being shitty, but Sadie's character actually has a reason for being how she is. I remember when she first appeared, and I was just sitting there thinking, why are you so hostile? But the more the movie went, I was just like, oh, this makes sense. She's also just confusing as hell, but to be honest, I like that. I love how Brendan Fraser's character just sees everything in such a positive light, that his own daughter is posting heinous shit about him on Facebook and his response is happiness because what she's writing is honest. How he's proud of her ratting out the Christian dude because he sees it as her helping him even if it was indirectly. And even though at the beginning I guess that the essay was written by his daughter, it was still a satisfying reveal and the way it played in the ending was great even though it kind of confused me. Oh, and the reveal that Brendan's ex was Hong's brother and how he had died and how it played out was great. I was thinking that Brendan was going to be the one to explain it probably to his daughter or maybe eventually to the religious dude, but having Hong get confrontational and in his face and eventually drop that bomb was so fucking good. 
And I get it, there was the controversy of having Brendan Fraser, a straight, non-fat man, play a gay, crippling, obese man. It's fine if that bothers you. I personally do not fucking care. Darren said that he went through many different actors before he eventually settled on Brendan because he was the one that gave the performance that he was looking for. And given the fact that he ends up objectively being the best part of the movie, I think that's fine. I've heard people critique the story. I think the story is really good. If anything, my only complaint is that it didn't leave me depressed as Requiem for a Dream did like I was expecting it to. Like, to put it in perspective, as I'm writing the script, I want to rewatch the movie. I don't ever want to watch Requiem for a Dream again. The Menu was a movie that I didn't really have any interest in. I saw one of the trailers in the theaters, and I think I recognized Ralph Fiennes, but then that was just basically it. So when the Dead Meat podcast did an episode on it, I just watched the entire thing, not thinking I would ever watch it. But then that episode made me interested in the movie, so I watched it when it ended up on HBO Max. This movie was really fun. Even though I had everything spoiled, my brain had basically a vague memory of what I was told in the podcast, so it was still a somewhat fresh experience. The only thing that was regrettable was when the sheriff is revealed to be a part of the team, because I immediately remember that when he showed up. It was still a funny reveal nonetheless, because I didn't remember how it was revealed, but it probably would have been a lot funnier had I not known or my brain didn't remember it. There is a lot of funny moments, with the one that fucking killed me being Arturo Castro running for his life before the countdown was even over. That was the most realistic shit I've ever seen in a horror movie. <laughs> I love how kind the movie is towards sex work and drawing that parallel between Anna Taylor-Joy's character and Chef, which plays out at the end of the movie with them being happy with providing services for the first time in a while. The pretentiousness of Tyler. His character is the annoying character that I want dead in every scene, so when he eventually does die, it's satisfying, but it's actually done right because he's an actual character. He's pretentious, selfish, only cares about impressing Chef, thinks he's better than everyone else, a fucking piece of shit. Unlike, oh, I don't know, Melody, who's only annoying for the sake of being annoying. And there's also the thing that I constantly bring up is how the movie is very aware that he's a piece of shit character. He does not get away with being a piece of shit. The other characters do not let him. That is the only thing I ask from those kinds of characters. I don't know why, but I also loved the critic and her, I assume, husband. Something about those characters I just really liked. Also, I had no idea that Hong Chao was also in this movie. She was pretty good as well, but she was far better in The Whale in my opinion. And I loved Anna Taylor-Joy in this. This is the first time I've seen anything from her, and she is now on the list of actors who are selling points for me. I thought she was fucking great, and her character was even better. The way she snapped back at Tyler for snapping at her, or even when she just immediately starts attacking him when she finds out that she's been taken there to die. How her character is basically a stand-in for someone like me, who doesn't give a fuck about the arts and crafts of food and only views it as something you eat to survive. Which, don't get me wrong, after watching the Demi podcast episode and hearing how Gressel talks about the art of food, I can completely understand that mindset. But personally, for me, I don't fucking care. I better not pay $2,000 for breadless bread, I swear to God. Just give me a fucking $10 cheeseburger. I'm hungry. So yeah, the menu is really good and really funny, and given how it's another entry in the stacked list of 2022 horror movies, I really need to start catching up, because I have severely missed out. Content warning for this section. If topics like grooming, molestation, rape, and pedophilia disturb or upset you, please move on to the next section. Timestamps in the description. Boy Scouts Honor is Bruce Nagel's first ever produced movie and director Ash Patino's fourth movie, and is a documentary about the child grooming that is in the Boy Scouts, focusing on three survivors of one particular predator. From the very beginning, this was something I was interested in because I was a scout from third grade to eighth grade. I don't think I ever got past scout though, because I stopped caring and eventually quit and Thankfully, I was never groomed. The worst that happened was one of the adults said that if I was found dead in a ditch from dehydration, he wouldn't care at all because I refused to take water. Because I was 14, I hated water. They were also serving ice mochas, so obviously I'm gonna go for that. Character growth though, because I got a bottle of water right next to me while writing this, but nonetheless, I was already interested in the movie just from the basis of it being about the scouts. But then of course, it has to do with the grooming, which, okay, I'm gonna be honest, I never knew about this until 2021 when my dad saw that a Penn & Teller episode was about it and we watched it. Needless to say, this sparked my interest heavily and 
boy, did it not disappoint. Now, I rented this and saw it about a week ago at the time of me writing this, and there's barely any information about the movie online, so I can't remember any of the names, and the only two that I can find is the pedophile and the survivor that the film primarily focuses on. You have Aaron, and forgive me, I can't remember the names of the other two survivors, experiences with Bill Sheehan. A kind of call-out post on Bill Sheehan himself for exposing the harm that he did, not only in the Boy Scouts, but in, I believe, teaching, as well as in a park that he built in a town that I can't remember the name of, that they allowed his office to be connected to the bathrooms. Yeah. And also a call-out of the main Boy Scouts organization, with how they have known for all these decades about the amount of pedophiles and grooming, and have files, files on, on top, top of files, files of all these scums that they've just locked away, transferring the scum to different troops and pretending like it's not their problem, but society's. It's honestly a pretty informational watch. Like I said, I wasn't aware of this shit until 2021, but the only thing I've seen on the matter is that Penn and Teller episode, and this documentary was able to provide a lot more information on the matter, which makes sense given how it was produced by Bruce Nagel, an attorney who seems to primarily focus on this issue, including actually suing them for hiding all this shit from the public. Yeah, that's another part of the documentary, is that while this is pretty much public information, the actual Boy Scouts organization does not say jack fucking shit about it. Which I mean, like, I get it, it's hard to get parents to let your kids join your group if you're advertising about how you have pedophiles, but at the same time, what they're doing is trying to hide it all and pretend like that's not happening, which is not good. And like with the Girls Gone Wild exposed, it's nice that the survivors get to put their story out there, and to speak about Aaron, because he's the main focus of the film, his story is sad. Going into sixth grade as an alcoholic because of what was done to him, but it's also nice that his parents cared about what was going on and made daily attempts to try to find out what happened. Yeah, it's a... Uh, it's a pretty heavy watch with... One bit of humor that I remember, and that was when Aaron got to the point in the timeline where he was first raped by Bill, and he just flat out says it immediately, pauses, has a bit of a chuckle, and then says, I'm not gonna waste any time. I thought that was kind of funny. <laughs> Now that's not to say it's perfect. During the tail end, it got pretty funny with how dramatic and stocky it was trying to be at times. Like, I felt like every editing cliche in the television drama thrown in, but unironically. And there are some very obvious cuts here and there, but given how this is Ash Patino's third movie that they've edited and second documentary, I can't really fault it that much. Like, I go back to the student films I made back in high school, and I could do the editing far fucking better now. And those only reach a max of 15 minutes, let alone 90. I also like how openly Bruce Nagel just uses the word pedophile. Like, he does not try to sugarcoat it at all, and I respect the hell out of that. But, yeah, if you can handle these kinds of topics and want to learn a bit more about the grooming situation in the Boy Scouts, and or just have an interest in documentaries like this, I would highly recommend it. Oh boy, yeah. So I somewhat grew up on Selena Gomez. I was a Wizards of Waverly Place kid, and also a Shake It Off kid, which I found out last week that she made the theme song for, and I'm still processing that. When it comes to her music, I've never really cared about it. Love You Like a Love Song is a bop, and her remix of Past Life is the superior version, in my opinion. So when I heard about this documentary, I decided to give it a watch, because fuck it. I may not be a big fan, but I do like her. And goddamn, I didn't know what I was walking into. Apparently, it was Selena Gomez just putting her mental health out on the table along with all the anxiety, stress, annoyance, and disrespect that comes from being in the limelight and being famous and saying, LOOK AT IT! I mean, for real, it was low-key kind of heartbreaking watching her rehearse a song about loving yourself and then smash cut to her crying backstage because her mind just picks apart every tiny little thing and treats her like shit and apologizing to the guy who signed her because she thinks that he might start regretting that decision. Like, holy fuck, is that relatable and I'm just a nobody and a nothing city. There's the paparazzi scenes, but we all know that paparazzi is trash. I'm genuinely surprised that's an actual job, and I think that if we're going to allow that to happen, it should also be legal to harm them, but that's just me. Seeing the behind the scenes of these celebrity interviews where most of the interviewers couldn't give two shits about who they're talking to, like there's the infamous one that most people latched onto after this documentary was released, and that I even heard about before watching this and then proceeded to completely forget about it until it happened, where the interviewer just asks a question, gets an answer, and calls it quits immediately afterwards, making Selena flashback to her Disney days and feeling like a product instead of a human being. Which, of course, because this is the fucking internet, people have to drop a fucking disagree and say that Selena's actually the rude one because of her passive-aggressive response. 
do you guys not realize that even though it may have been a misunderstanding and that the interviewer didn't intend to come off the way she did, Selena is still a human being and has feelings and can take something targeted towards her and respond it in a natural way that human beings tend to do? You're gonna sit here and tell me you've never felt like you were being treated like shit so you responded to it being passive aggressive because that's your natural thing to do even if it was a misunderstanding? Jesus fucking Christ, I wish the internet would learn that humans are complicated. It would definitely lower the amount of Tylenol I have to buy. Anyways, there's also questions she's being asked that are just cookie cutter basic bullshit to fill a quota and doesn't have anything to do with who's being interviewed. Or my favorite example, the guy who tells her he wants to just sit with her and talk about boys right after she comes back from a trip to Kenya because she wants nothing to do with love and relationship and boys. I mean, I have my personal pet peeves with a lot of interviewers, my biggest one being when the person just constantly fucking talks and you barely even get to hear anything from the person being interviewed. Like, shut the fuck up, I am not here for you. I don't know you and I don't care to know you. But seeing the BuzzFeed GQ wire type shit of answering basic questions that can be applied to anybody format but from the behind where you get to see how it's like filming that kind of shit was really interesting and I can totally see how doing those constantly back to back to back can just be so fucking tiring. This is why we need to put as much respect on your Sean Evans or your big boys because they seem to do interviews right and make it fun and not just a cog in the content machine. Where the fuck am I going with this? The documentary isn't just all that, though. You also get these really wholesome scenes where Selena does what I've always dreamed of doing, and that's going back to your past and your childhood, the places you've lived, the schools you've gone to, and reminiscing over it and seeing it after years and years. There's that really funny scene where she accidentally slips up and says ass in front of a classroom, and then that really adorable freakout of one of her old neighbor's daughters after she finds out who Selena is. And amidst all of this is Selena trying to figure out her place in the world and what she's meant to do, which at the end of the documentary, she basically comes to the conclusion that she wants to be a mental health advocate and try to make something like therapy or classes about feelings be more accessible in schools, which is really nice. And the film ends with the title track, which is a fucking mood. Overall, I liked it. I think if you're someone who cares any bit about Selena Gomez, it's a really interesting watch and I would highly recommend it. Oh boy, yeah. And of course, Everyone has their own opinion, but my opinion is the best opinion. I'm sure you figured that out already.